When I was student, when I first get into clinic, the most difficult thing I feel for Crown and Bridge is the impression. At preclinic, we practice enough of prep and temp, but not impression because the type of lung is different than real patient's mouth. The gingiva is different. So we were not able to practice enough. So I always feel this part needs a little help when we get into clinic. So I'm giving this lecture to help you get through the crown and bridge impression. First, you have to set up. It's always helpful if you get a list of what you need for each procedure. For setup for impression, this is the list. When you have a list, when you go to the dispensary, you actually can get everything you need instead of going back and forth, oh, I forgot this, I go back to the line, waiting in the line to get extra supply. Or in the middle of a procedure, oh, I forgot to bring this. So this is a list for what you need to bring for your crown and bridge impression setup. When you first see the patient, you remove the temporary, and you sometimes you need to refine the prep, smooth all the margin before the impression. You also have to try the custom tray, adjust the tray, coat the tray with adhesive before you start the impression. You put that aside. When you're ready for impression, the tray adhesive is already set. You don't have to wait more time for the adhesive to be set. For packing core, you need hemoden or viscous um, we, we Our school used to have both. Recently, we only have hemoden. I personally like viscous better. Hemoden is working okay. Um, viscous viscous that, and for me, it stopped the bleeding a little better. It's iron sulfate. I tell the patient this is iron sulfate supplement. It tastes horrible, but it's not. It's good for your health. So they usually accept that. Hemoden is aluminum chloride, not as good as the iron supplement. For the cord, the most common number is double zero, zero, or one. If you have to use two, sometimes the patient probably have to go through the period to get the deep clean, the scaling root planning to get rid of the pocket first. So usually up to one is enough. And you also need core packer and scissor. When you get the cord, I usually pre-cut them. I like the cord with dark color, like this one black or very dark blue or you know, dark green. The, the color has to be in good contrast with the tooth and the gingiva. I don't like the, the, the light yellow when you're packing. You don't know whether that's gingiva or your cord. So you pre-cut, uh, for pre-molar, I usually wrap around my pinky. And for molar, I usually wrap around my index finger. I pre-cut them. And then I soak them in the viscostat or hemoden first. In this picture is the viscostat. This is a video of how to pack cord. If you look at in the video, and uh, usually when you pack it, very common students say, I push it, it bounce back, I push it, it bounce back. Um, you have to have a certain motion, look at the movement. You, the tip of the core packer has to roll a little bit to push the core down and roll to let it tuck under the gingiva. You have to feel where is the margin, where is the gingiva, and where is the sulcus. And then you press the cord past the margin to go in the sulcus, and then roll a little bit to let it cut under the margin. If you just push down it, very easy, it will come up. Also, if you look at where I started, the most common location I started is either medial or distal. Over there, you have more gingiva. Uh, the socket is usually a little deeper. It's easier to pack in there. Facial and lingual, lingual sometimes the, the pack is very, very shallow and difficult for the cord to go in there and stay. So you start either at the distal or medial, and then you pack 
all around and, and so that's why you see on this video I start at the middle. Once the needle stays in there and then I keep going, it will be easier. You go from the easy place and then once that goes in, you just go continue from where it's already in and uh, keep hacking. You see it goes down, it has a little bit roll motion, not just push down. It just push down and uh, it can the, the ginger can bounce and push the cord out. And I pack everything and get it in there and sometimes I leave a little tail if it's enough I leave a little tail a common question students ask me do I need to pack more cord and uh, you know I usually tell them how they can decide whether you need to pack more cord or not after you pack the first cord and uh, you want to see do I see gingerbread cord and the mar and the tooth margin three of them nicely separate look at this picture you can see the gingiva you can see the cord the black cord in there you also can see the nice margin all around is the same so this you don't need to pack another cord on this picture if you take a look and over here the gingiva is almost close on top of the margin, especially here. And over here is separate enough, but here is too close. So you need to pack one more cord on top of that. When you don't, when you just take the cord out this way, the impression material need to flow into there. And over here, the gingiva is already close on top of the margin. So your impression material will not be able to flow in there to separate that. So you're not able to read the margin nicely. So situation like this, if you can see the three gingiva, cord, and mar uh, tooth margin nicely, pack one more cord, it will help separate the gingiva and the space will be bigger when you load the impression material it will go in nicely. Also, there, if, you, if you have uh, start with double zero cord and uh, you pack, you need to pack another cord or triple uh, zero. Now the triple zero is available and uh, you pack that at the bottom and then you pack another cord on top of that. And once you take the top cord out, if you see the margin nicely, not blocked by the cord and the gingiva is away, you don't have to take the bottom cord out. This is actually is uh, when people call it, uh, call it double cord technique. Uh, so sometimes you're, you're lucky, you're able to keep the bottom cord in, only take the top cord out. That actually will be very helpful. You have less chance of getting bleeding. So uh, you know, for for case like this, if you pack one more cord on top of that, and if you take a look everywhere, the, the margin is above the cord. The cord is not touching the margin at all. Don't have to take the bottom cord out. So triple zero, you have more chance to be able to use, do the double cord technique. Double zero, sometimes you're able to do that add another double zero or zero or one on top of that. Sometimes the gingiva socket is very shallow. Even just one double zero, you are already blocking the margin. That cord has to come out completely. Um, custom tray. Um, you actually, you can use stock tray if you only take impression for a single crumb. When you take impression for a bridge or more than three unit, you want to be more accurate. Stock tray, the thickness of the material may vary according to the location. Custom tray, the thickness is the same. So you, you, um, you should use custom tray material. When you have the same thickness everywhere, the shrinkage is the same. So your impression has less distortion. So for more than three T's location, like a three unit bridge or, or more, make custom tray. When I make custom tray, I actually uh, 
Doesn't matter whether it's upper or lower, it's horseshoe shape. If you look at this, uh, this model, I actually draw, this is done by a student. I help him draw where he should end the, the custom tray. Both lingo and buckle are about two millimeter away from the tooth margin. At the impression area, you can be a little bit further away, three to five millimeter away from the, from, uh, from the tooth margin. So this way, doesn't matter whether it's upper or lower, the custom tray is horseshoe shape. I don't like to cover the palette. You don't need to cover the palette because when you do the ditch and die, if you have palette, you have to cut that palette away, more actual work. Also, if you cover the palette, when you run the material, the material might squeeze to the back, the patient may gag. If you have horseshoe shape custom trait, the material will drop out at the front, won't get pushed back to the back. Um, when you do that, make sure uh, you get a spacer for the custom tray, about two millimeters thick. And you can use the wax and the cover with the aluminum foil, or sometimes I just fold multiple layer of aluminum foil, not using wax. As long as you have enough space, um, about two to, yeah, about two millimeter about spacing, that should be good. For the handle of the custom tray, I remember when I was a student, I made the handle very short. And this student actually brought me the custom tray with very short handle just in this area. So I let him add the handle longer because with small handle, very difficult to grab the, the tray. When you load it, if you grab that little handle, it's very slippery, it can drop. When you remove it, the handle is small. You're not able to put enough force. If you look at the stock tray, they have very nice long handle. So you should make your custom tray handle long. And so I told the student to make the, uh, the handle longer. So he add a little extra material, makes look like a duck's head. Impression material, and I have picture of two different impression material. This is the impression material goes on the gun. And uh, this one is the light body that inject around the teeth. It's very running, it can pick up more detail. This is regular body. This is used to load the tray. There, uh, also the heavy body material is available, it's thicker. I, there's no big difference between the, uh, the regular body and the heavy body. I personally like the regular body. The reason for that is it's easy to squeeze the gun. The material comes out easier. So I like to use the light body. But if patient is a gagger, I will use heavy body. Heavy body doesn't run that much, so it, it will have less chance to cause the gagging. Before you start the impression, always double check. Your material is fresh. There's no material that run to the other side causing the material to clog the, the cartridge. It happened to me once. When I start load material, everything looks perfect. Core packing, no bleeding, everything's perfect. But the material is stuck in the tip, in one of that. And uh, I run, I load the injectable material on the tooth, beautiful, nicely. But this material, can, the medium, uh, the regular body cannot be squeezed out. Only one material comes out. The other material, it clogged. So I can't use it. I have to start all over again. It happened to students as well. So always double check. Make sure you have fresh material. They're not, you sometimes student is messy and the material is running everywhere and the one type of material run to the other tip and that as long as it's touching the area, it will start to clog. So make sure when you, before you start taking impression, double check your material are good. We also have 
the material coming out of the machine and uh, two different machines same thing and uh, they uh, they have different uh, consistency one is a little bit more heavy thicker and uh, <clears throat> also double check everything is clean and make sure the material can run out before you start load on the teeth and uh, this material is the material with, I think it's with Impregound, and each material has different light body um, come with that. And the tip is different. You just flip this open and then the material can come out and get into the tip and mix in here. And they also have different type. Um, you load it, you load, you push, you load the material in here, and then you use this part press in, then the material will, will mix at the tip when you load on the patient's teeth. This is the one with the gun and uh, it's not with the machine. And uh, I like the yellow tip with the little yellow. It's smaller, it's easier to control, it's easier to get into the sulcus. So I always add the intraoral tip of the yellow one in here. Another thing very, very important, make sure you block any undercut before taking impression. For example, if, they, if the patient has severe periodontal disease, has a lot of embrasure space, do not just take impression. Take some peripheral wax and put at embrasure area, block the undercut. Or if this patient has a three unit bridge or longer bridge, and it has undercut, make sure you block the undercut. Otherwise, your impression material goes in, finish set. With the undercut, you can remove the tray, especially with the bridge. And sometimes the tooth is already compromised, already loose. When you have undercut, when you try to remove it, it's almost like taking the tooth out for the patient. And for the bridge, if the undercut locks it completely, you can take the impression material out. Then you're going to have to cut the tray, cut the impression material, take it out. Otherwise, you're going to take the tooth out. So be very, very careful. Double check. Make sure no undercut before you start the impression. This is a video of taking impression. This shows the material of this cassette. And uh, they have a syringe with the brushing tip. I like this very much. Before you take the impression material out, make sure you wet your cord first. If you have two layers, you wet one, uh, the top layer, you take it out. And then if you have to take the second layer out, you wet it before you take it out again. The reason for that is if your cork, you've been working in there and the cork gets dry in the mouth, once it's dry, it can stick to the gingiva and the little epithelium can, can dry and stick on the cork. When you remove the cork and then you can pull the epithelium out, then you're going to get bleeding. So make sure before you take the cord out, always wet it. And uh, you can wet with hemodent as well. Hemodent do not have the little syringe with brush like that. So you can get a little cotton pellet and stick in the hemodent and then wet on the cord and then take the cord out. And after you take the first layer, wet it again. If you have to take the second layer, take the wet the cord before you take the second layer out. You can use the floor to get it out or you can use the polished tire if you have a little tear to come out. So when, once it's finished, you can rinse it, you double tap. Um, I have no bleeding, you can, yeah, you can rinse and dry it. In case you have bleeding, don't take the impression. You won't get good impression. Quickly pack another cord soaked in this or that or hemodent. Quickly pack in there again. 
and then you take the cord out, the bleeding usually will stop. If you have someone who is very, very difficult, okay, you have bleeding problem, the bleed, the bleed so much, you cannot control the bleeding. Sometimes I will use the lidocaine with more epinephrine in there. You inject in the local and then you to pack the cord one more time. When you pack the cord second time, do not press very hard. And um, just press a little bit, make sure the cord is soaked with the liquid fat or hemoglobin, and then you can take it out and the bleeding will stop. Now you can see the impression material is loaded on the cheek. Always start at the distal of the cheek at the greater area first. The reason for that is the gravity drops to the back. If you start from the medial, sometimes the material flow to the back and the trap the bubble in there already. By the time you get to the distal, the bubble is already trapped in there, very difficult to push out. So you start at the distal of the tooth. Make sure it's where the gravity will flow to. So if you get that area covered without bubble, then you have less chance getting the bubble again. And if you look at this video, the tip of the um, impression gun is always buried in the impression material. And you push, you push more to let the material flow in front of you. And then you move your tip, follow the impression material. So the impression material will flow into the cell tip. Once you cover all of the teeth, you load the tray. When you load the tray, make sure you find the correct location. And you load it in and you push it in in one motion. Try to not move the tray around. When you move the tray around, try to fit in the teeth. You may, you may uh, trap the bubble under there. So just one motion, you go in and you find the correct spot and then you push against the tooth, let the tray get in there and try to not move too much after that. And when you, uh, <clears throat> once the impression material is in there, you also have to make sure you wait enough time. Each material has its own waiting time. In the school, the material, takes longer to set because students usually do everything slower. And uh, in the private practice, uh, usually people's material is faster. They, are, they can do faster. So read the material, how long it's going to take to set. And uh, you wait that much material first. Not only you have to wait that much um, time, but also before you take the impression out, check the material outside. I usually, um, I will check the last little material on the tip. Make sure I use my finger or use core packer to press on there to make sure it bounces back. It doesn't form the dent. If it still forms the dent, wait a little bit longer. If it bounces back nicely, that means the material on the tip is already set. Usually inside the mouth set faster than outside the mouth. So you can take the impression material out. <clears throat> it happened to me once. The, the batch of impression material has some problem. I, I waited according to the, the amount of time written on the cartridge. But for a couple of weeks, all my crown doesn't fit. It took me a while finally figure out it was the impression material. That batch of material doesn't set as what the label said. So always double check before you take the impression material out in the mouse, double check the tip of the last material comes out is already set. And once you take it out, you want to see whether you have good impression. You have to see nicely, just like here. This is where the sulcus, the material flow into there. And the margin is nice and you, you don't have bubble anywhere. And also do one extra things before you go pour the model. You use the wax, any type of wax is fine. You use the wax to run the wax on the outside. Make sure it doesn't run to the inside to touch the margin or the tooth. And some, this one actually, the 
the sulcus because the cord was packing very nicely. The, the sulcus is thick enough. Sometimes you have very, very thin material left in there. If you do not put the wax on top of that to support this, and it can bury in the stone. When you separate the impression material with the stone, that get buried in the stone and very hard to read where's your margin. If you run the wax on the outside of the little material, and once you take it out, you will look at your model, you almost half ditched already. It's very easy. After you finish impression, you also have to take by registration. You can use the Registel uh, wax or GC resin. And usually for students at the beginning level, um, you take the maximum interpretation uh, because most of your teeth are present. That's the easy way to duplicate back what the patient has. And sometimes you need centric relationship when you missing a lot more teeth, you need to uh, make the bite into a more ideal position. But for student beginner, the most common position is the center, maximum in the cuspation. Regisil is easier to take. You just need to run on the teeth and patient bite down. Um, but it has one disadvantage. It's difficult to mount when it's, it bounces back, when you put the two models together. If, if you don't use your hand to hold it tight, when you finish mounting, you see your model is separate. You are not really in, the model are not touching because the register push it away. So you have to really hold the model very tight with your hand and then let your friend load the material to mount the model on the articulator. Wax is easier to mount. When you push it down, it doesn't push back, but it takes a little extra time to take the bite registration. GC resin is when you have more missing teeth, you roll a GC resin ball and put in one, some error. And sometimes I would, the rest of the error, I still use the register or wax to pick up. This, this is Regisil, and it's a little rigid. When you finish take the bite registration, if you're taking at maximum intercuspation, you should see every tooth touch. You, when you hold through the light, you should see the, uh, the Regisil material is very, very thin. It shows through. If you, if you take maximum intercuspation, but you only see a couple of teeth showing through, that means your bite registration is not correct. You have to retake it. Also, when you finish mounting the model, you have to see anywhere that shows through. That means the patient's teeth are in contact. The model also has to be in contact. And if you look at this material, it's not a lot. If you take with register, make sure only a small amount on the occlusal surface. Don't put too much. If you put too much, it will be difficult to mount. The material will, yeah, the, the model is difficult to see through. The material will push the two models separate. When you have less material, it's easier to mount to hold the two models together. And when you finish taking the bite registration and everything, you reline the temporary with a like. You can even reline the per temp with a like if you need to reline a little bit. You just have to grind the material into the fresh material. You cannot use the old one we, which already have 10 bound and dirty, messy to reline. It won't uh, go on. But if you grind away both inside completely and outside a little bit, you reline it, the material will stay on nicely. Make sure you check the occlusion, you cement with the 10 bung, clean away the extra cement using Explorer and, and floss and go over the home care. And also don't forget to pick the shade. You don't want the patient go home, oh, I forgot the shade, then you have to bring the patient back again. <laughs>